guess um, that's an example of something that was recognized many years ago, but took a long time to get done. And that's why it's important for what we do, but also for what you do and other future generation of students do to help make uh, this campus and this community more friendly and more sustainable, not just for cyclists, but also pedestrians and frankly just the, mo the entire equation of mobility. So, um, you know, part of sustainability is how do we get around and move around um, in looking towards the future. And in the past, it's been, you know, more lanes of traffic, more roads. Um, this, the uh, government is spending a billion dollars now to put another lane on the 405 freeway, which if you've been on the 405 freeway, you know that's been going on. Um, and just a fraction, a little over 10% of that billion dollars for one lane on the 405 freeway would allow us to implement all of the bicycle lanes that we've envisioned for the city of Los Angeles, 10% of that for one lane. So it's a question of priorities, it's a question of recognizing, as many cities throughout the world have recognized, is that you can't build your way out of the mobility issue just continuing on this current um, path of more and more lanes accommodating more and more cars that we, like other major cities, need to really look at different examples. And I want to talk about a few of those. First of all, um, how many, uh, Alexis asked a lot of good questions, but I want to, how many of you have a bicycle? Whether you use it or not, how many of you have a bicycle? Okay, that's a great number. So, um, um, how many of you wrote, heard about uh, Ciclovia that happened uh, on October 10th in LA? And of those that you heard about it, how many of you actually participated in it? Um, that was 7.5 miles of streets going from Boyle Heights to East Hollywood through downtown Los Angeles that were closed off for traffic for five hours. And estimates of 60,000 to 100,000, mostly cyclists, took advantage of that five, opportun five hour opportunity to ride through that stretch of Los Angeles. It was really inspiring and amazing. And it really kind of shows that latent um, interest. And it wasn't just cyclists in, in spandex, it was families and little kids and, and walkers and roller skaters and lots of other things, but mostly it was cyclists. And um, I think that that was a demonstration that um, there's, there's a lot of need there. And, you know, there, it's going to be handled differently in different parts of the city, but I want to focus in on this part of the city. First of all, let me just briefly tell you that the city's Bicycle Advisory Committee was established by Mayor Bradley over 30 years ago, over 35 years ago, um, as a way to get input into the city departments and elected officials on bicycle matters. It's comprised of one appointee from each city council district, council member, and four from the mayor. So 19 members. It meets every other month. Um, we're currently meeting in, in Hollywood and there are public meetings. You're certainly welcome to attend and provide input on that. I want you to know it exists because in case it comes up in conversation with other people, you should know, hey, there is this advisory committee to the city. In addition to the advocacy groups, like the LA County Bicycle Coalition um, that are out there uh, pushing for bicycle matters. Um, secondly, um, the universities are a major cycling uh, opportunity, sometimes realized and sometimes not. Uh, a 2009 study uh, sh at, for University of Southern California showed that there were from 10 to 15,000 cyclists who regularly cycle to USC. Now I realize that the geography is a little bit different in terms of where the housing is for a lot of the students for that campus, um, as opposed to this campus where there is more commuter. But even for this campus, I've been given a number of 4,000 cyclists um, associated with, with Cal State Northridge. Um, and if, if we don't know that actual number, we, we need to, to get that number and get that potential. Um, 
I, I want to talk a little bit, though, again about this campus and uh, some of the neighboring uh, streets. Um, Reseda Boulevard um, is in the plan to be continuous all the way down from the north end up in Porter Ranch all the way down to below Ventura Boulevard. It already exists south of Van Owen. We're trying to close the gap south of Parthenia uh, down to make that connection to Van Owen. Uh, there is a narrow section right at Chase, but hopefully within the next several months that can be installed. Um, as part of that linkage is a narrow section around Sherman Way where there's sharrows that have been installed. Sharrows is um, is a shared lane marking, and if you see the, and there, there's only this is the only set that's in the San Fernando Valley. But if you see a little chevron with a bicycle symbol, that's its indication to motorists and cyclists that share that lane, um, and that's in lieu of there not being adequate width without doing something like removing parking to continue that bicycle lane. So I do hope when you're cycling that you'll use uh, facilities such as that. Um, just recently, there was bicycle lanes, uh, it was mentioned earlier, put onto Wilbur Avenue between Nordoff and Chatsworth Street. Um, this was as actually part of a road diet that was, actually in, that was actually begun a year ago when the department, city's Department of Transportation proposed taking out the two pedestrian crossings at Prairie and Superior that serve the two elementary schools, Callahan and Topeka Drive. And, um, uh, they were the the neighborhoods really upset, and they got got over 600 signatures to tell DOT they didn't want the the crosswalks removed because uh, lots of issues safety of the kids going to schools, cars using Wilbur as a bypass street and traveling at high rates of speed. Um, I've been told 60 miles an hour, even though the speed limit's 40. Um, they saved the crosswalks from being removed, um, and then. Um, uh, several months ago, the, search, uh, the street was being resurfaced and uh, markings showed up that showed that it was going to be reduced from two lanes each direction to having a two, I'm sorry, from, four, from a total of four lanes, two lanes each direction, to one lane each direction with a middle turning lane, which is for safety, so you can make a left turn without being rear-ended, um, and, and adding bicycle lanes and retaining the parking. And uh, as was mentioned earlier, this has become a controversial issue because some of the people who don't live in the neighborhood there are, have been used to using Wilbur as a high-speed uh, little bypass to get around, uh, to get where they want to go. And so um, one of the criticisms that's been mentioned by some, the elected council member, who was mentioned earlier also, was that no, no cyclists are using Wilbur. Um, but in, in reality, many of us do use Wilbur, and I would ask you if you're out uh, going from, from here to there, whatever, try to use Wilbur. It is a, it's a great street, especially if you think Reseda has too many cars on it, um, uh, even though they're not going as fast as Wilbur used to go, um, Wilbur is a, is a good alternative. But I think it, 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 um, it makes the case that it's always important to have community outreach, not just for the people who live in the area, but also for the organizations that serve the area, including the Neighborhood Council and also the city's Bicycle Advisory Committee. We are supposed to get that information, and we didn't. Um, one other local issue was Zelza Avenue to the east of campus. Um, a couple years ago, there was a proposal uh, that actually went into effect to increase the speed limits. And um, I won't go into all the details, but basically the way the state law is, is that the, if the police department wants to enforce using radar, they have to set the speed limit within the 85 percentile <laughs> of, the, of the speed of the traffic that's using it. What that means is under state law, there's a speeder set the, the speed limits. And this was a, a uh, difficult lesson to learn for the folks who are involved with the high school, Granada Hills Charter High, uh, some of the religious institutions, and the neighborhood along Zelza, um, that they had no control over how fast the speed limit would be on that street, especially given there have been 
CSUN students that have been injured, there have been other people who have been killed, pedestrians have been killed on that street. So that's another issue that we um, need to be concerned with in terms of cyclist impacts. Um, am I out of time? <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. Um, so I would just um, re-emphasize that um, your, your involvement, both here on campus as well as surrounding the campus, that you're not on your own. There are organizations you can work with on campus, and if they're not doing enough, speak up, stand up, and get them to do more. But also insist that more be done around the campus so that it will make it easier to use bicycles as an alternative form of transportation to get to campus um, because it's not just what is on campus but you have to have the links there and I'll just conclude by saying the and you're going to be hearing either next or the second person next about the city's bicycle plan um, you know right now there's really not much being provided in my opinion for uh, part of the backbone to serve the Cal State Northridge campus we already have Reseda Boulevard um, we have Plummer Street existing to the east, uh, but that's not designated as backbone. Lindley is being proposed as a neighborhood friendly street, but if you've been on south of the campus, but if you've been on Lindley, you'll know that there's two lanes and there's not much room for a car and a cycle, so you really have to take the lane. So um, I think we need to do more work, in my opinion, to advocate for uh, making the streets around Cal State Northridge better and safer and make more connectivity with what we already have. So I'll conclude there. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm here to talk about electric bikes. And uh, basically, the response I always get when I, I say I produce or I sell electric bikes is, you guys are lazy. Um, basically, uh, on the contrary, it's a regular bicycle with an electric motor. And um, that's the thing that's helped for us if we're, if we want to go to a certain area fast, and we have to go a few miles or 10 miles, that's where the electric bike comes in. And I ride my electric bike to work for several reasons. One is for my health, I, I need the exercise. The second one is I love bicycling. I love I love to be connected with, with community. Um, and the third one is I don't produce any you know carbon uh, emission. Okay, let me show you the um, my commute to work. It's like 18, 18 and a half miles from Rancho Santa Margarita to Dana Point. So it only takes me like an hour and nine minutes to get there. So I I'm, I'm, I'm basically have, um, the speed is about you know, 17 or 16 miles per hour. So I'm really hauling going to my workplace. And on, on this electric bike, you still need to pedal. You know, we're not using just the electric motor. I am pedaling, doing the motion, and while I'm pedaling, there's a sensor that kicks in, and the motor helps me out. So I'm, I'm, my, my bicycle is like 90 to 20 miles per hour, so it's pretty fast. Okay, it's, it's fun, it's easy, and environmentally friendly. Of course, benefits of cycling, of course, regular bikes, same way. You don't need parking fees, um, no emission, it's fast. Uh, you can exercise, it's quiet, no traffic jams. You can um, go through the side, side of the street or, or different uh, routes. More benefits on the electric bikes. You know, travel faster, shorter commute, commute time compared with regular bicycles. You can carry heavy stuff. You can have panniers. 
Uh, you can have grocery bags and no problem, you know, right